<coughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. We welcome you to this Tuesday night. We are glad that you are with us. And uh, I am excited to have Brother Shelton back with us on this Tuesday night. And uh, I enjoyed getting to speak last week. And, and I, I do know that any week I could take that Tuesday night and it would be perfectly all right. But God has done some things, put some things together, and we are doing our best to follow what the Holy Ghost has instructed us to do. And uh, But I am glad that he is here. Glad to have Brother Nichols online with us, of course, Brother Glacier. And uh, all of you that are joining with us, I may not can see who you are, uh, but God knows who is listening and what needs to be heard tonight uh, in this service. And uh, I, I rejoice. We had a great weekend in Mississippi and uh, there with brother and sister Leva and the church. And uh, thank you, Brother Nichols, for, uh, for Sunday and uh, the reports that I've heard of those receiving the Holy Ghost. And uh, I'm excited what God is doing. And uh, but on this Tuesday night, this is a new night. It's a new day. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of what God is orchestrated and has put together. Brother Shelton has been extremely uh, busy. There's a lot of folks getting back to some things and he's had uh, meetings that he's getting caught up on and places that he's going. And uh, I, I, I've been trying to uh, look to see exactly where he may be tonight. Uh, I, I, I think he is at home in his office. I, I, well, I see shadows of the ducks. I don't see the ducks, but I see the shadows of them. And uh, so we, I know, see the oil field. There's the ducks. He's home. Thank the Lord. Uh, we are still en route to get home. And so we're, we're believing God for great things. We're thanking the Lord for them. And uh, last night, Brother Shelton, your wife posted about gumbo. And I've heard about this gumbo. And she's, uh, she had plates for sale. And I, uh, I asked for six servings for eight. And uh, it, it got threatened to be put in an ice chest. And, and I just don't want my gumbo in one of my eyes, uh, <clears throat> it, it would be just simpler for me to, to buy the stuff here and have her come to Houston and make that gumbo. Uh, I've heard a lot about it. One day the Lord's going to allow me to eat some of it. But we have tasted of the word. And I am excited yet again tonight to have... Brother Shelton with us uh, on the line. And uh, I know the big word right now is thanking. People are thanking God for they feel like that we're living in a post-COVID era. Uh, gasoline has gotten so high until somebody said that Corona can't travel anymore. Uh, we're thankful for that and what uh, it hadn't took out the war that's going on uh, overseas has took out the rest of it apparently and people are thanking the Lord every way we turn about being in a post uh, pandemic time and glad things are getting back to normal. Uh, things are not normal. God is still calling for the church to be abnormal in this world and to be different and to be a part, a part, not a part, but 
apart from the world. And uh, I, I was asked again this week, how long was this going to continue? And uh, I said, until the Lord says something different. And we have been listening, uh, paying attention. And, uh, but I'm thankful that we have received uh, the word that we have heard thus far. And uh, just let me go ahead and tell you, Tuesday night next week, you don't want to miss. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. Brother Shelton, we are glad that you are with us. And uh, I, I want you to take this service. I want you to obey the Lord. Speak to us. Walk down the charging cables of our devices. And just come right in where we're at. Uh, you can have your shoes scuffed up by the word. They ain't got to come down. We used to say they walk down the aisle and down the pew of where we're sitting. I want them to walk in the spirit and down to where we are. And I truly believe tonight that the Lord has something specific to say to the church. Not, not talking about just sanctuary. I'm talking about to the church. And so it doesn't matter if you're in Houston, you're in Arkansas, if you're in Florida, New Zealand, if you're in Barcelona, or wherever else you may be, God is speaking to the church. And we're glad that there is a voice that is uh, attentive to what the Holy Ghost is saying in this hour and is telling us and is echoing. Brother Shelton, we love you, we appreciate you. Thank you for taking out of your time to be with us yet again on this Tuesday night. May the Lord bless you is our prayer. Amen, welcome. Well, thank you, Brother Bourne. <clears throat> Give honor to you and Sister Bourne, pray the hand of God be on you as you're traveling. And, um, <clears throat> I've heard it said a lot of times. I've said it a lot of times. Uh, the only people who think traveling is glamorous is the people who don't have to do it. And uh, there's nothing, there's nothing glamorous about hotel rooms and gas stations and airport bathrooms and airports and airplanes. And uh, it is no small thing when when someone has to uh, go out and travel. And uh, so I, I give honor to the two of you for being willing to answer the call of God um, and go where the Lord tells you to go. I know your heart is in Houston, um, and that is second only to your heart being in the kingdom first and foremost and your choice of locations in the kingdom is no doubt Houston and specifically 4400 Fulton. Um, and I know it's not an easy thing for you guys to have to be gone, but I remember 10 and a half years ago, Eliana was six months old and, uh, I had to go to Singapore with Brother Wright and I did not want to go. He knew I didn't want to go. And he was already, he left, uh, he and Joel left two days before uh, David Wright and I left. And so we went to the airport early on the morning of our flight and Brother Wright called Pastor David Wright from Singapore and ask him, is Scott in the car with you? Somebody had picked us up from the church and was driving us. He said, did Brother Shelton get in that truck with y'all? He said, yes, sir. He said, does he have his passport? And, and of course he said, well, I don't know. I hadn't asked him. He said, uh, ask him and make him show it to you. He knew how bad I did not want to go. And he was, he was not going to take any chances. And um, 
we went, but as I was leaving the country, um, I had been wanting to be a dad my entire adult life. And now here I am one and six months into this little project, the Lord decides, uh, you're leaving your wife and new child for 10 straight days. And, uh, I'm just here to tell you, I wasn't very happy about it. And so <clears throat> the Lord spoke to me and he said, you know what? The best thing you can do for your family is take care of mine. And the best thing you can do for your house is to minister to mine. You take care of my house, my kingdom, my business, my family, and I'll take care of yours. And so you have that assurance and you have that comfort and peace knowing that God's going to take care of things, but it's not easy being gone. And, um, you can't get that time back. You, you cannot, as the old saying is, you cannot unspill the milk. And, um, so I give honor to you and I thank the Lord for y'all's willingness to obey the Holy ghost. And just to whomever it needs to be said to, uh, I have not talked to Brother Bourne, and um, I'm not so sure that I've come in complete and total peace tonight. So uh, if I was you, I would I would start quickly searching myself because it's very possible that the Lord has already been searching and may yet have to talk about some things. I don't know. But what I do know is there was a point when Moses' siblings uh, murmured and complained, and they make a statement in Genesis. I believe it is. I can look it up real quick. But they said, uh, who is Moses to think that he's the only, does he think he's the only one that hears from God? We hear from God, too. Uh, I read that scripture here, I think, a few weeks ago. Um, and the following sentence in that scripture the last sentence is and god heard it and i'm just going to tell some of you the lord heard you now the last time the lord told me to tell you that it was mercy this time you're about a half a foot away from judgment and if i was you i'd be very careful you think that you've said what you've had to say and and god hear it and if he did he didn't mind because you know what's best, and God will get on board with you. Well, I got news for you. That's not the case. And you've angered God. I'm telling you right now, this is about the only heads up he's going to let me give you. I'm just telling you, you, somebody has angered the Lord. And were I you, while we are yet on this Internet, I'd, I'd be finding a way to do some repenting right on today. I wouldn't wait. I got a call. We're going to be reading out of the book of Second Corinthians. And just so I can be on record as having said this again, uh, Brother Bourne and I have not been chit-chatting about it. And so uh, I'm just I'm just telling you uh, this morning, uh, way on early, last night, way on in the night, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, in fact, last week, this stuff came to me. And uh, I felt like perhaps I was supposed to say it last Tuesday, and we tried to figure out how to make that work, and we could not make it work. And finally, we just concluded that it was not the will of God for me to be on here because this was where I was headed, and I knew that was where the Lord was going to go, but it wasn't time, apparently. But tonight, apparently, it is. Um, but I do give honor to them, to Brother and Sister Nichols, to give honor to you, value you highly thank the lord for your involvement in the kingdom and um brother Bourne's already said it but to be able to know there's someone there covering it and and a move of god that takes place uh, even when the man of god has to be gone the other man of god's there it's just it's invaluable and i give honor to you guys for that brother glacier and all the saints of god love and respect and honor Second Corinthians chapter number 10. Now, I, <clears throat> my throat hurts uh, for some reason today, and it's not COVID. Uh, 
I've already had that this year. Um, it's sinuses. It was when I got up Saturday morning and Brother Herod and I left Chicago, it was 10 degrees. And yesterday it was 55 and today it's 75. So it ain't no wonder somebody got stopped up nose. That's all I can tell Second Corinthians chapter number 10. Uh, we're just going to start at verse 1 and meander along and peruse wherever the Lord would have us do so. And wherever I stop or wherever the Lord stops, I am very likely going to go back and read it again in the Passion Translation uh, because I was reading it just a few minutes ago when Brother Bourne was talking. It's very powerful. Now, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you. He's talking about himself being base among you, um, but being absent and bold towards you. Now, I'll just, you'll, it'll make more sense in a minute when we read it out of the Passion Translation, but he's basically telling them when I'm with you, I'm a little more gentle, but when I write letters to you, they're pretty strong. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. What he's saying is I've had to take a pretty strong stand with some folks because they look at what we're doing and think we're doing all this in our flesh. There was a time when um, not as much anymore. I have not heard it at least as much lately, but there was a time uh, I used to hear this a lot. Uh, God would begin to increase someone's kingdom involvement. And um, I would hear people make really foolish statements like, you know, he's just trying to build his own kingdom. Uh, he's just trying to build himself up. He's, and, and this is one of those deals that Paul is dealing with and addressing here. Um, there are some who think of us as we're doing this according to our flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Uh, I'm going to just tell you, sometimes we say things with our mouth that was just an imagination uh, in the beginning, and we let our imaginations run wild, and we put words to it. And what was imaginations in the beginning now becomes a weapon because you put the power in the tongue to it. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. When your obedience is fulfilled, do you look on things after the outward appearance? Are you, are you saying what you say and doing what you're doing just based on the outward appearance of what it looks like to the natural eye? For instance, a backslider, we see somebody walk out of the kingdom. We automatically look at that and think and say, well, I guess they don't want to live for God. Well, that's not necessarily the case. But we make that statement based on what we see in the flesh. Paul asked the question, do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ or that he belongs to Christ, let him of himself think this again, that he is Christ. Even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Paul's telling them, if, if I tell you, look at the terminology he uses, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, I shouldn't be ashamed of that. There's a spirit of the enemy that wants to run among the ministry, and, and you're supposed to cow down and pretend like that you're not anointed and that God didn't just use you powerfully. Um, and that God didn't do something great and wonderful through your ministry, 
uh, and you're supposed to have fake humility. So you appear to be humble and Christ-like. But Paul is telling them, um, if, if, I, if I brag on myself just a little bit, I, I'm, I'm not going to feel bad about it. If I tell you how the Lord used me to do something, don't expect me to feel bad about that. I'm not going to be ashamed of being honest about how God's used me. Uh, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak. He said, boy, he writes, some of y'all say I write a strong letter, but I'm weak when I'm in person. And his speech is contemptible, not a good speaker. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. <clears throat> For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. He's telling them, now look, you, you think I'm only strong in letter, uh, but don't, don't, don't think I can't be just as strong in person. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you, according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, for he that condemneth himself is approved by whom the Lord commendeth. Now I want to read that in the Passion Translation. And if I have a little interruption while I'm going along here, my wife is up at the church working and could not get back in time. And uh, Malachi just made himself known. He's had a little bathroom excursion. Hopefully one of his sisters can assist him in that endeavor. But uh, should that not be the case, I may have to uh, and it'll be just like when you take your children to the nursery in church. <laughs> now, the Passion Translation. Now, please listen. For I need to address an issue. Look at how good to Listen to me because I'm about to deal with an issue. I'm making this personal appeal to you by the gentleness and self-forgetfulness of Christ. I am the one who is humble and timid when face to face with you, but bold and outspoken when a safe distance away. Now I plead with you that when I come, don't force me to take a hard line with you, which I'm willing to do by daring to confront you, uh, by daring to confront those who mistakenly believe that we are living by the standards of the world, not by the Spirit's wisdom and power. I want to stop right there. We are not, he said, uh, living by the standards of the world. And I do realize that in the world's scope of things, there is a certain way things should be done, even in the Judeo-Christian world. Um, there is a expected way there's uh this is how it is and um we make crazy statements like you know if you want to do that then you need to just go do that well the problem is carnal christianity non-spirit led church folks do not understand someone who is led by the spirit a person who is not led by the Spirit doesn't understand. It does not make sense to them that someone uh, is totally and completely led by the Holy Ghost, does exactly what the Lord wants them to do, period. 
But the world standards, even the Christian world, they might say, well, an evangelist is supposed to function thusly. Um, a teacher is supposed to do this, and a pastor is only supposed to do this. Um, and I guess in, you know, some Never Never Land, um, that's probably doable. But in the apostolic church, that's not doable. God applies each of us to his kingdom wherever, however, and whenever, and to whomever, for however long he wants to. I was asked recently, Brother Bourne, uh, in addition to what you said earlier, the same question. How much longer are y'all going to be doing that? And I looked at them and I, I said, well, I guess until God's done. That's all I can tell you. He didn't tell me an end date. He may have told the bishop, but he hadn't told me one. All the Lord told me over five years ago was, you make yourself available to Brother Bourne and the church in Houston. And that church becomes a priority to you. And unless it is absolutely unavoidable, I'll be with Houston any and every time the bishop says I'm gonna be in Houston, period. If this is the last meeting, that's fine. I'll miss you, but if God says this is it, this is it. But I don't sit around anymore asking the Lord how much longer, how much longer. I just wake up every week and every day and do what he says do today and let the church roll on. I'm not planning for the future, not trying to figure the future out, not trying to understand it all. I don't know what's going on overseas. I don't know about what's going on in Canada. I don't know about Mexico. I don't even know about the whole state of Arkansas. What I do know is it sitting right here behind this desk in my office at my house. I have full and complete total confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am fully aware of the fact and convinced of the fact that he is in charge and knows exactly what he's doing. That's what I know for sure. I also, in addition to that, know that not one time, not, not one time, since I'm nine years old, when I received the Holy Ghost, has he asked me for my opinion or asked me how I thought he was doing? <laughs> Not one time. So I can only conclude, since I don't know about everybody else's business, I only know mine. He may have a whole lot more confidence in everybody else's perspective, but he, he apparently is not all that impressed with how I feel about things because he don't sit around asking me. And if he's not going to ask me my opinion about stuff, he apparently don't need it. And if he don't need my insight, then I simply need to sit down. I was in the car with a pastor one day. We we're on the way back from Kansas City, back to their city they lived in. We'd been over to a meeting and, we're going down the interstate, and this car was going just, I mean, they were batting it down the interstate, and boy, here they come past him, and he was a fast driver. And there was a sign on the rear passenger window that said, get in, sit down, buckle up, and shut up. <laughs> in other words, if you're riding with me, get in and buckle up and don't say nothing about how I'm driving. <clears throat> well, it's kind of the opinion I've got that the Lord must feel that way about his kingdom. You're going to be in it, get in it, buckle up, and do what I tell you to do, and don't you worry about how I'm driving the old gospel ship. He was piloting this ship long before I was ever even in the womb, and when the grave has taken me, should I not live long enough to see the rapture? He's still going to be driving this old gospel ship all by himself. He don't need our help. <clears throat> and so... Those are the things I know. I know God's in charge. I, I look, I don't understand gas prices. I, I don't I don't get it. We're sitting on more oil than just about anybody in the entire world. And well, it's politics. I, well, I don't fine. So be it. Maybe it is politics. Probably is. Uh it's the dumbest politics I've ever heard of. And it's absolutely the dumbest economics I've ever heard of, but whatever. And then the lumber prices are going up and, and 
Everything else goes up. State goes up. If they haul it on a truck or a train or a plane, the price of it goes up because fuel is more expensive. Lord have mercy. I don't even understand it. I don't get it. I was filling up my tank for $50 or so a gallon not too long before now. And last night it was $100 plus. And I, I wasn't even on completely empty. I don't get it. In, in Illinois the other day, it was $4.56 a gallon. I heard in California, it's $7 and something a gallon. Colorado, $5 and something a gallon. But what I can tell you is what I've said to you before. The story of Goshen is in that book so that when times like this come, we don't lose our faith and lose our balance and lose our trust and lose our vision and our sight and our, our understanding of the kingdom. There are stories like that in the Bible that keep us on the right path. And so he told them, he said, what we're doing here in this kingdom deal is, is not um, according to the world standards. And if you're trying to make what we do measure up to what the world does, it's never going to measure up. It's never going to look right, never going to be the same. So you're going to have to do the same thing we're doing, leaving you. And that is, he said, trust God. I'm going to tell you something. It's a hard thing when carnal people have spiritual leadership. Now, it's not hard for the spiritual leader, but it is torment for the carnal follower. Carnal followers are miserable people when they've got spiritual leaders. The most contentious people in the church are carnal people, always, 100% of the time. The most carnal people in the church are also the most contentious, argumentative, gripingest, whiningest, undermining this bunch of people that the kingdom has ever given birth to. People that are trying to undermine this and undermine that and go around this and circumvent that and what, they're carnal. And they're having a problem with having spiritual leadership. Well, this don't make sense to me. Well, guess what there, Sparky? It probably don't make sense to the leader leading you either. And if you think that every time God sends your pastor or the bishop or whoever in leadership to do a certain thing, if you think they enjoy uh, the rigors of all of that, I got news for you. That's not the case. But our love for the kingdom and our trust and faith and surrender to the king doesn't allow us to tell him what we will and won't do. Do you think that all the Israelites liked it every time Moses said, whoop, we got to go, boys. Back it up. No, like Moses, are you kidding me? We just got here two hours ago. The, the folks at the back of the camp are probably just now unbuckling the buckles on the packs, fixing to put up their tents. Can't help it. That cloud's already moving. We got to go. Now, the people in that column, do you think they were mad at God or Moses? Moses, because they could see him. They could attack him. They could go after him. Well, show them where are you going with all this? I'll show you when we get there. Carnal followers are miserable people when they have spiritual leaders. Paul told them we're not doing this by the world standards. I don't care what that church over there is doing. That's not what we're doing here. I don't care what normal looks like across town. That's not what we're doing here. I don't care what your granny did and your, your auntie did, and I don't care what your papa used to say or do or how your former pastor preached or did or what that evangelist said. We're, we're going to follow the Holy Ghost. That's what Paul's telling them here. He leads, we follow. He, he Paul, was, Paul was pretty committed to that position too because in another letter he said, you follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm following Christ and you've got book to validate that and you can absolutely see that my, my trajectory is in the pursuit of God, then you do the same thing. Why didn't Paul say to them, y'all follow Christ as I do? Have y'all ever thought of that? Why didn't a brother say, okay, dearly beloved, you follow Christ just as I do. He didn't do that. 
Paul said, hey, right, right here, you follow me, I'll follow him. That's what he told him. Well, son, that's what the King James says. I know, but that's how we'd have said it in Arkansas if he'd have been here when he said it. I'm going to follow him. You follow me. Why? Because spiritual authority and kingdom structure is non-negotiable. Paul said it already early on. He said, if I have to tell you that my anointing is here and yours is here, I'm not ashamed to have to do that. Paul, here's how convinced of it Paul was. In another letter, he says to the church in Philippians, he says to them, oh, church at Philippi, Philippi I, I, I want to go be with Jesus. I've got all my affairs in order. I've got my house done, my wheels drawn up. I've got the executor of my state in position. I want to go be with him. Been trying to get him to come get me and take me home, matter of fact. And then he says, however, it's more expedient for me that I remain here with you. You are the reason I can't go on to heaven. I got to stay in this wretched world to help y'all. That's pretty bold. How would, how would we feel if the pastors in our life walked up to the pulpit on Sunday and said that very thing? You shut up all that griping and complaining. If, I, if God took me out of here right now, you'd be lost in 24 hours. Because some of us don't believe that. Some of us don't believe that the, the only thing standing between us and the gates of hell is the man of God in our life. The scripture says we can't be saved without one, so you figure another way out about it. And when you're not praying right and when you're not pushing right and you're not believing and living exactly the way you want to and the hounds of hell are wanting to drag you down, guess who's standing between you and them? That man and woman of God in your life that stands in the gap and stands between you and the enemy and, and says, no, there's a bloodline here. I plead the blood over them. You can't have them. But it's awful funny to me that the very first time that same spiritual leadership says God said go this direction, the one that got saved by that spiritual leader but was too carnal to know it is the very first one to bite them when they decide to lead as God leads. But the unfortunate thing is the leader don't have an option. He's got to lead the poodle or the pit bull. It don't make any difference. He's either going to lead a lion or a lamb. Sheep or goats. He just got to lead. But he can't make us follow. The world standard says, figure out a way to please everybody. Apostolic standard says, you better please Jesus and let him and everybody else worry about their business. I'm going to tell you what my motto would be if I was pastoring. You follow me as I follow him. Well, I got a right to hear from God for myself. You, you know what you did before you submitted? Whoever your pastor is, if you said God told you to submit to that man's pastoral authority, at that moment you submitted, you gave that man authority in your life lead and guide you. You don't come back then. I Do you honestly think I'd get on the phone and call my bishop and tell him what I'm about to go do and ask him to bless it? I was talking to a pastor today. He said, you know, he said, I've got to the point that when people come in my office and want to start talking about what they're about to do next, I stop them just pretty early on and very gently ask them, are you asking me or telling me? Let's let's settle that right now so I know how to deal with this whole conversation. The world standard says we just go tell our pastor what we're about to go do. The apostolic standard says we go to our pastor and say, hey, I've been feeling something. Is this something I need to be praying about? Do you feel a witness to this? And if he says no, guess what, baby? We're not going to worry about it no more. We're just going to move on. I called my bishop on today. I texted him. 
because somebody had called and contacted me about coming to preach in their church and, and minister to their people. But I felt a bit of a check. So I called my bishop or texted him. Here's the situation. Here's the person. Do I go or no? Yes, you need to go. I'm 53. I'll be 54 in a couple months. But I still don't see myself as having the right to circumvent my authority and the man of God in my life and go do my own thing. If you like being uncovered on a snowy night, laying out in the yard, getting snowed on, then so be it. But I don't. I like being in the house where it's warm. I like having a warm blanket and cover. I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine what it'd be like to run through this world, running my mouth about the man of God in my life. Are you crazy? Have you lost your ever loving mind? I haven't always liked what my bishop told me to do. Matter of fact, I haven't always even agreed with some of the stuff he told me to do. But I would rather that. He's rebuked me in front of God and everybody on multiple occasions while I was yet in the pulpit. Did it once in Houston. But that's okay with me because I want to be saved. I think sometimes we in the church want to be used more than we want to be saved. We want to be seen more than we want to be saved. When am I going to get my time in that pulpit? When are you going? You know what? I don't understand the small mindedness that just clamors and, and begs for a pulpit. That's because you're in them all the time. Maybe so. But when I wasn't in them, I, I didn't sit around pining the time away wondering when I was going to get a chance to preach. When's my ministry going to be used? When are my gifts going to be noticed? When am I going to get the nod? Really? Is, is that what this has come to? That's the world standards. That's Judeo-Christian standards. And one of the tricks the enemy has run on the church is, if they don't use me, I'll go somewhere where I can be used. So then it becomes a threat. And it's all about, oh, Jezebel then. Well, I'm not Jezebel. I'm not possessed. You ain't got to be possessed to become a door. And, and to be up there saying crazy stuff, you know, wherever you are. My gifts are not appreciated. I'm not, I don't feel valued. I don't feel used enough. I get it. I really do. But you can't think about the kingdom through those paths. You can't be led by the Holy Ghost with carnal logic and carnal reasoning and fleshly lust and desires. Do you realize that is fleshly lust? Well, I've got a word from God. Of course, we've all got words from God. <clears throat> but I don't want to preach or teach or talk until it's time for me to. I got enough sense to know, and I hope everybody on here does. If God don't need me, I don't I don't want to be out there chirping on the branch somewhere. So he's telling them, I got to move on. He's telling them, we're, we're not living by the standards of the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're leading by the Spirit's wisdom and power. For although, verse number four, for although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons using, uh, oh, I don't know if y'all are reading this in the Passion Translation, but look at the terminology. We do not wage a military campaign, okay? Now, that's what he says first. It is a military campaign using manipulation to achieve our aims. He just said anybody who tries to manipulate leadership so they can get what they want is engaging in a military campaign. That's spiritual warfare because that's the way Jezebel acts. Have you ever seen that? Have y'all ever noticed that? We're not using manipulation to wage a war 
against somebody in authority, against a brother in the church, against another member of the leadership team that I'm a part of. We're not competing with one another. There is no, hear me when I tell you, there is not supposed to be, but no, let me rephrase that. In God's house, there is no competition. In his will, there is no competition. And if you're in competition with somebody about what you're supposed to be doing in the kingdom, you are wasting your time and you as a valuable resource are being squandered and the people that we should be reaching and talking to about the Holy Ghost are being lost. Because I'm busy trying to figure out when my number's going to get called. This is not the Department of Motor Vehicles where you go in and pull a ticket and set up on somebody to call your ticket number. I've said it in your hearing before. It's not the first time you've heard it. But there was a time when men of God left the prayer room to go preach. Now we have to just nearly force one another out of pulpits to go to the prayer room. There is no greater place of ministry than the ministry of prayer. I stood right out here in my front yard yesterday talking to a man of God, and he said to me, one of the, one of the, one of the most wise, deep, and profound things that we could say to one another. He said, Believe this now. The brother said, Brother Shelton, if God don't have something for me to say, I don't want to preach for the sake of preaching. He said, I know I'm called. But if it's only to say something one time, just before the rapture, that's fine. This stuff about, okay, here's, here's how manipulation works. Manipulation starts out with me telling somebody that I know will tell somebody, and eventually it's going to get back to the person I'm talking about because I don't have the spine to go talk to them myself. I'll say this to you over here. You'll go over there and say it to them. They'll probably say it to four over here. And then somebody in this group's going to get it back to whoever I want it gotten back to. And this is manipulation. Well, I just, you know, I don't know what my place here is. I, I mean, I'm faithful. I, I, whatever. Okay, well, what is that, that designed to do? Even if it doesn't, in your mind, compute to that, in my mind, compute to that. What is that kind of stuff designed to do? It's designed to make its way back to the person that I have ought with, that I feel ignored by, rejected by, whatever the case is. And they will hear by some other source that I'm a hurt, I'm offended, I got a problem with something. And then they'll come to me and they'll try to fix it and they'll ask me, hey, what, what's wrong? What's going on? And to a degree, until we can get some things worked out, maybe, maybe that's okay once or twice. But the problem is, after it happens once and then twice and then three times and then four times, it becomes something that I realize at that point this is a way for me to control the narrative. If I act mad enough, offended enough, and threatened to leave enough, I'm not going to go tell this man I'm leaving, but I'm going to tell everybody else I am, and then this man's going to call me. Guess what I just did? I controlled him. The best thing an apostolic leader can do when they catch wind of that stuff is just keep right on trucking. Because if they give in to it and call and check on me and say, hey, what's going on? I heard you were upset about something. Guess what? Spiritual authority just came down off that wall and handled this by carnal standards. And spiritual authority was just lost.
So he said, manipulation is a weapon in a military campaign that's used to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle. Oh, wow, this is powerful. Instead, he said, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Brother Warren was talking about how we used to say all the time, people just walking down my pew. That's what I'm talking about. That's what, that's what he's talking about right there. Spiritual weapons, the gifts of the spirit are used to dismantle the things that we hide behind, things that we put up and fortify ourselves with, and then the enemy uses that. We've gotten word that we're trying this yet a third time. If I've ever felt, make sure I'm on, if I've ever felt that something is trying to prevent what is being said is happening, is happening right now. And I'm, I'm calling on some folks from sanctuary to pray because there's a word that's going forth. I'll tell you a little more. Ever the spirit of distraction, I curse you. Ikihila Mahata, you little boy, we'll see. Do you love you little Mahata? Go ahead, Brother Shelton. Ye see, he tell you, he love. I echo Brother Born saying, Do you all the hot? The enemy is certainly fighting and doing what he can to cause a distraction and a disruption. Uh, and the blood of Jesus will cover us and all will be well. Uh, I don't remember exactly what verse I was on or don't know what verse I was on when this went off, but uh, I'm going to pick back up at verse number four. For though, although we live in the natural realm, we don't wait the military campaign employing human standards human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. He said employing human weapons. Flesh. Don't use flesh and blood. Don't use the weapons of flesh. Let it be the spirit. Verse number five, he said, we can dismantle. The, and Brother Boren calling for the prayer warriors at Sanctuary to start praying. Well, there's how, that's what we do. We can dismantle every deceptive fantasy that opposes God. How? Through prayer. And break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, now this is, I think I was off when we were off there when I got to this one. He said, we capture like prisoners of war, every thought and insist he doesn't just say that we capture every thought. He said we insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. How do we capture every thought? By doing what we're doing here on this internet. By the preached word of God, whether it was Sunday morning, Brother Nichols, whether it's me tonight or Sunday, Brother Born, it doesn't matter. The preached word of God goes out and every high thing that has exalted itself above God, we begin to pull that down with the word, with what God's told us, with what the spirit is saying. Let him that hath an ear hear what the spirit's saying to the church. The spirit is saying to the church right now, it's time for us to turn our face in a more apostolic direction. But the enemy doesn't want us to because the minute we get in that posture, Everything's going to change. The gifts of the Spirit operate more fluidly. Supernatural ministry gifts operating, uh, signs and wonders, apostolic things being done, people being delivered and set free, filled with the Holy Ghost. So, of course, the enemy doesn't want us to ever truly become spiritually minded and spirit led in the kingdom. But when that stuff starts to raise itself against God and against spiritual authority, 
we take authority over it and we pull it down and insist that it bows in, in obedience to the word of God. That's why we don't let division lie. That's why Paul said, when you've got people among you that are causing division, mark them. And if that don't work, drive them out. That's what spiritual authority does. The world standards, Judeo-Christian standards say, well, just make it, everybody just, you know, we're all different. No. Yeah. The scripture says we're not all different. We're all. Mark them and kingdom. ignore them. Mark them and ignore them. Well, uh, he won't talk to me. You've been marked. Well, Brother Shelton, I just don't feel like that's a very loving church. It is a loving church, and we love the innocent enough not to let those with a negative, nasty, bitter spirit infect them and destroy them. Since when was protecting innocent sheep anything other than love? What in the name of God is wrong with us? Have we become so weak, our spiritual constitution, that we can't allow spiritual authority in the house of God to do what it's supposed to do to protect the weak among us? The innocent among us? Well, I just don't believe that you pastors, that pastors shouldn't be so hard. Pastors don't want to be that hard. Pastors don't want to have to clean your plow every day. But for the love of God, we can't get people to go to prayer rooms. I was talking about it a few minutes ago. Prayer? It's the number one most important thing you can do as a child of God, whether you're in the ministry or out of the ministry. Verse number six, since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, look at the terminology he uses. This is not my terminology. This is, this is what Paul said. Since we're armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. We've got dynamic weapons. We've got spiritual authority. And any spirit that rises up in rebellion, and see, here's the problem. Some of you, if you're still on here, are mad right now because I'm talking the way I am and you're wanting to talk about, well, I still, you still don't get the picture. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not talking about punishing a human being. We're talking about pulling down spiritual strongholds, whether they be in the county or in an individual, whether an individual has a spirit plaguing them, whatever the case would be. He's telling you, we're trying to deal with a spiritual enemy, not flesh and blood. But there's people right now that'll be mad either while this is live or later watching the archive and will be sending out little snippets of it. Oh, Brother Shell, I didn't say nothing. I'm reading the word of God. Brother Shelton said we ought to be punished because we've got an opinion. That's not what I'm saying. The spirit of rebellion, Paul said, is what gets punished. You seem to always be looking at people by their outward appearances. Well, now that's something, isn't it? You're always looking at people by their outward appearance. You look at something and you think you know what's really going on. I'm going to go ahead on and say it. Well, where's Brother Born at this weekend? That ain't none of your business. <clears throat> well, what are we paying him for? You're not. You're paying tithes so you don't go to hell. Well, I don't understand why he's not here. Because he can't be. God said not to be. Do you think he's enjoying sitting in hotel after hotel after hotel? Me, Brother Nichols, and Brother Glacier can see him on this camera. He's squirming because his back or hips or something certain. He can't even sit still in his chair, hacking and coughing the whole time I've been on this internet. Do you think that's where he wants to be, feeling bad? No. But there's a man and woman of God in Sheridan, Arkansas, 
who are benefiting right now and an entire church full of people that are benefiting by this man and woman of God being there. Am I going to be so small minded that I'm going to say, I don't care what happens to that other pastor. I don't care what happens to that other church. He's our pastor and he ought to come here. Well, let me ask you a question then. If he's at your house and not somebody else's, do you want somebody else to be mad at you because Brother Bourne's over there praying for you? No. Well, I just don't understand. Of course you don't. You're carnal. But if you get up out of that carnality and be spirit-led like your spirit-led leaders being spirit-led, it'll all make more sense to you. I know you love them. I know you miss them. They, they sit not knowing whether some of you will even be there when they get back. Because you got your little feelings hurt. Oh, so help me God. Get all upset and offended and whatever and mouth and yeah, yeah. You think God didn't hear you? Well, he did. And it ain't right. And you know who you are. And if I was you, I'd be repenting. I'm telling you before God, I'd be repenting. You look at everything. You are so critical and judgmental because you look at the outward appearance of it. You look at what the natural eye can see and you make some shallow carnal assessment of the entire spiritual situation. I, I don't even know where, I know where it's coming from. Somebody better perk up and hear the Holy Ghost. That's all I can tell you. And you ought to thank God we're doing this by internet. Because if this was in person, me or anybody else probably would have been down and got you by the ear and drug you to the altar or you'd have had to get up and walk out one of the two. Release the man of God to be what he's supposed to be. Our judgment's coming. And I'm not kidding you. And this is not hyperbole. Judgment is coming if you don't stop. And everybody's going to see it when it happens. There'll be no hiding it. I don't believe in that stuff. I don't care. Not long ago, a man of God was called by God to do something that he had never done before, didn't really have a whole lot of premise for other people that had done it to come and help him do what he was being told by the Holy Ghost to do. The spiritual authority in his life told him, yes, this is the will of God, do this. Well, somebody else saw it and, and didn't agree with it and didn't like it and got whatever and sideways with the man, put their tongue on him one too many times and went in for a small little doctor's appointment and found out they were just full of, of sickness. And it's just the hand of God that they're not dead right today. They are in the recuperation stage. I know several cases going on right now, that very type of thing. Jesus meant what he said about touch not and do not. You wouldn't stay willing to sit under somebody who berated you and talked about you and mealy mouthed you all the time, then don't do it to them. Quit looking at what your natural eye can see. Quit getting bent out of shape. Quit going to other innocent people in the church and spreading your mess in their hearing. They feel sorry for you. They're trying to be kind to you. They don't want to hurt your feelings but you won't shut your mouth. And so you just keep on and it's like a cancer. And you think that it doesn't, you think it, <laughs> you think it's okay. And I'm telling you, God is doing you a favor and showing you one more time how much he loves you by talking to you over the internet on tonight, repeatedly saying, stop, just stop. I don't know, Brother Nichols, more plainly to say, 
I, I don't know what else to do or say. The Holy Ghost wouldn't let me say it last week. I had to say it tonight. I, stop it. Stop it. You seem to always be looking at people by their outward appearances. You don't know. You don't know the burden your bishop carries. He didn't go looking for all these external opportunities because it's appointments, it's assignments that God has not just trusted he and Sister Born with, but that church with. And I'm going to tell you something. Churches that can't be trusted will be left right where they are. But God has trusted the church. And to those of you at Sanctuary in Houston that are on board with whatever apostolic thing God calls your pastor and, and your leadership and your church to do, you need to let your voices be heard. There needs to be an orchestra of intercession going on round the clock until this spiritual stronghold is pulled down. And if somebody has to leave and go to church somewhere else because they won't be delivered, then so be it. But this stuff has to stop. If someone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should remind himself of this. We belong to Christ. No less than he does. I'm not ashamed, even if I've come across as one who has overstated the authority. This is my statement. I'm not ashamed, even if I've come across as one who has overstated the authority given to us by the Lord. For it is the authority to help build you up, not tear you down. Do you not understand that when God sends a man of God somewhere away from what we thought was his permanent and one and only singular post, it's not for the demise or the degradation of the people following him. It's to build you up, open more doors of opportunity for ministry, for the church to grow. Here's the thing. Whoever you are doing all the murmuring and complaining, what you are too small-minded to know is because God has expanded the kingdom and that responsibility, it's made room for ministries in sanctuary to grow and to move up further up the ladder and to move into a broader capacity. And you're going to miss the very opportunity you say you're waiting on because you're being such a mealy-mouthed little person that God's going to have to either purge you out or forget about you altogether. The very thing that you're using to tear somebody down with was intended by God to be the opportunity that you've been asking for. Y'all feel free to rebuke me at any point. He said, I don't want to seem as though I'm trying to bully you with my letters. For I can imagine some of you saying, his letters are authoritative and stern. But when he's with us, he's not that impressive. And he's a poor speaker. Such a person should realize that when we arrive, there will be no difference in the actions we take and the words we write. Brother Nichols, is that clear enough? I don't need to go into great elaboration on that, do I? No, sir. You are dead on that. Is this where it's supposed to be? Yes, sir. Do you feel a witness to it, Brother Nichols? Yes. Yes. Okay, your prophetic gift, I'm relying on it. If I get off, just give me a sign. Dead on it. All right. <clears throat> so he told him, he said, listen, don't you don't you worry about it, he said, because if, if you think that I'm not strong enough in person, you need to know this. When I get there, if you're still acting like the little idiot that you're acting like, the words I say in the letters are going to be the actions I take in person. As strong as I've been in these letters, I'm going to be just that strong when I get in your presence. If you don't get it under control and stop this nonsense, when I get there, it is not going to be good. Of course, we wouldn't dare put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. They compare themselves to one another and make up their own standards to measure themselves by. 
And then they judge themselves by their own standards. What self-delusion? In other words, when I sit around and say, well, I don't think, well, I think, well, I feel like, well, I this or will I that, that's what he's talking about. When I create my own standards, Brother Nichols, if I'm reading this correctly, if I create my own standards, I'm completely deranged. And in the Passion Translation, from verse 12, right above verse 12, the heading says, Paul's Apostolic Mandate. <clears throat> then they judge themselves by their own standards. And he said, he said, they judge themselves by the standards they create for themselves, and that's delusion. So a person who judges themselves by their own standards is by scripture and the words of Paul delusional. How can anybody have confidence in a delusional person? You can't. But we are those who choose to limit our boasting to only the measure of the work to which God has appointed us. We're only going to talk about what God's called us to do, he said. A measure that, by the way, has reached as far as you. And since you're within our assigned limits, we didn't overstep our boundaries of authority by being the first to announce to you the wonderful news of the anointed one. We're not trying to take credit for the ministry done by others, going beyond the limits that God set for us. Instead, our hope soars as your faith continues to grow, causing a great expansion of our ministry among you. Then we can go and preach the good news in the regions beyond you without trespassing on the ministry sphere of other labors and what they have already done for the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. So let's be clear, to have the Lord's approval and commendation is of greater value than bragging about oneself. I was on the phone today, I believe it was Brother Shock, Brother Brian Shock in Conway. And he asked me this question. He said, what is, or do you know, has God said, do you have any clue, what, what is the word to the church? What is, what is the Holy Ghost saying to the church? And I said to him, and you brethren judge this, but I told him, I said, well, you know, I, and I didn't say this part out loud, but I was thinking it. I am always, seems like just Debbie Downer. I, oh, oh, oh me, boy, that's just, it's, it's judgment and, and God's mad and you better straighten up and stuff like this tonight and whatever. So in my head, I'm thinking, really, this, this again? But I'm going to tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost, Brother Nichols, and, and I, I really do feel it very strongly. The fear of God, it was said in Chicago at Brother Betcher's church at the Passing the Mantle Conference. Uh, if you're in the ministry, you, you ought to put that on your, your calendar, that date for next year. Oh, so powerful. But, and that's not a plug for him. He didn't ask me to do that. I'm just telling you it was powerful. But in that meeting, I believe it was Elder Brother Herod made the statement. The fear of God has got to return to the church. I've been saying it for years. Others have been saying it for years. But when he said it this past week, something, Brother Nichols, in the spirit began to shake me. I, I mean, the fear of God. And, and I, I, would, I would have said prior to that moment, I've got a pretty healthy dose of the fear of God. But I'm telling you, in the moment that he began to talk about it, something got a hold of me fresh. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, I began to search myself and look in me to see if there would be any wicked way in here that would not please God. Something began to stir, and the fear of God is coming. And I've said this in your hearing before concerning the fear of God. I do believe scripturally that God used mercy first to, to resurrect and reignite the spirit of the fear of the Lord. But when mercy doesn't do it, when mercy doesn't cause us to stand in awe of him, 
At that point, judgment is the only thing left in God's hand to bring to the church, to get us to the place where we stand once again as we should in awe of him. And Brother Nichols, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be dramatic about the whole deal, but I told Brother Shock today, I said, uh, one of the phrases that keeps coming to me over and over and over is make ready. You better make ready. You, you, better, you better prepare yourself, get your house in order, go through the thing, sweep it, dust it, make sure it's purged and cleaned out because judgment is coming. I don't believe, and, and, and of course, again, here I go, but, uh, and, and I've, I've had even my friends tell me, you, you act like you don't like anybody. I love everybody, but I, I don't like Satan and I don't like sin and I don't like demonic spirits pilfering about in the church trying to derail what God's up to. But as sure as the Lord lives, I am convinced that whatever amount and measure of the fear of God the Lord tried to bring to us in recent times, I don't think, I do not know for sure, but I don't think that everybody was open to it and received it. And I don't believe that as a result of that, we're going to go back to a blanket assault of judgment on the church. And I do not believe that we're going to go back to um, just a blanket application of the anger of God. But I do believe there are some isolated situations and places where the fear of God is coming through the form of judgment. Judgment is going to be what it brings it with. And, and it may be somebody dying. It may be churches going through stuff as a body. I don't know what it's going to be. But because mercy could not turn some, judgment's going to be the only thing left for God to try to turn some people. And if that don't work, he's going to release them to go do what they want to do while he brings harvest and revival to the body of Christ. It's like in my spirit, I hear this clock ticking, 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 ticking. And it's, it's I want to scream. I, I, I'm, I'm desperate. I, everywhere I go, it seems like I'm on this hobby horse all the time. And I feel like I want to scream, make ready, make ready, make ready. The bridegroom's coming. The bridegroom's coming. Are you paying attention? Are you awake? Are you alert? Are you ready? So let me go back to verse number one and finish up. Now, please listen. For I need to address an issue. I am making this appeal, personal appeal to you by the gentleness and self-forgetfulness of Christ. Now, please listen. I'm going to my seat with that. Now, please listen. Not to me alone, but to what the Spirit is trying to say to the church. You not just the corporate body, but you as individuals. Please hear what the Spirit is saying. Brother Bourne, that's what I know. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Shelton, for the word. Those that join back in with us, we are going to work on getting this <clears throat> combined together. I may can say more later, but all I can say is thank you, Brother Shelton. I want to be saved. I want to hear the voice of God. And I want to follow him as closely as I possibly can. I don't want to stand in judgment. And not have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Love each and every one of you. 
May the Lord richly bless you tonight is my prayer. And uh, Sunday, 11 o'clock, I'll be there. Um, Coming expecting something great from the Lord. And then back here on Tuesday night, 715. Uh, we'll announce it for 715. We're generally a little bit uh, after that getting started, but we we do our best to, uh, to be as punctual as possible. The Shelton, we love you, and I thank you for plain spokenness, plain speech. Uh, God bless you tonight, in Jesus' name.